Hare Krishna. I'm a little amped up right now because my brother Sugar Ray asked me to do a forward for his book. He got a book coming out. I've never written a forward before. You know what I'm saying? But there's a first time for everything. I mean, I'm always on Facebook and Twitter and writing to people in short bursts. So I guess, I mean, I could write a forward. I guess, what's that, a few paragraphs or a couple of pages? I don't know. But we're going to see how it works out. He wants me to talk about karma and violence. First of all, karma is a vast subject. And if you read Bhagavad Gita as it is, you'll see that in the third chapter, there's karma yoga. And then the fifth chapter, karma is explained slightly differently in the chapter called karma yoga action in Krishna consciousness. So that's the third and the fifth chapters deal with the science of karma. Very, very, very vast subject. I don't know how much I'm going to touch on that. But um, when we're dealing with violence now, violence is an interesting thing because a lot of people shun violence. You know, there should be no violence. Everything should be perfect and pure. Well, this is the material world, and I hate to break it to you. There's going to be violence in the material world. Root cause of violence can be of two natures. It could be based on survival, and it can also be based on, let's deal with lust, anger, and greed real quick. When we contemplate on the objects of our senses and an attachment forms, that attachment sometimes turns into lust. When lust is not fulfilled, then anger comes, and from anger, the sister of anger is destruction. We lose our intelligence when we become lustful. Lustful is the first stage of loss of intelligence. And of course, lust can cause us to do a lot of dumb stuff, you know what I'm saying? I, Well, I ain't even going to go into the dumb stuff I used to do as a younger man, you know what I'm saying? Not like I'm like totally purified and that there's no lust or material desires in my heart. But I'm just saying, generally when I was younger, I used to do a lot, you know, I would travel very far in the name of lust, very late at night, you know what I'm saying, going to different neighborhoods that was real rough or dangerous or whatever, all in the pursuit to, to please my little material senses. You know, it had its time. Anyway... When we deal with lust, it degrades everything that the higher senses are capable of, namely the upper chakra system. We got to really concentrate on remaining in the mode of goodness at least through our lifetime. Sattvika. We got to stay in sattvika, and that's the upper chakra system. Once we keep living on the lower chakra system, we're dealing with basic instincts like survival. Where does violence play its part into, into all of this? Well, going back to survival... Humans generally do the things that animals do. Generally, humans in this age. They eat, they sleep, they mate, and they defend. And all of those things are intricately connected to violence. Because to sleep, one must have some secure surroundings. So then it might be necessary to fight to secure your surroundings. That's where security, sleep, and defense, you're defending your territory. They go hand in hand. To eat sometimes, especially in third world countries or where resources are scarce, sometimes there's a fight. We see animals fight for food all the time. We'll see hyenas and lions go at it over a dead carcass. It happens. We'll see humans in lesser developed countries. They might fight over resources like grains or barley or whatever. It happens. So violence and eating go hand in hand. I mean, even if you want to say, all right, well, a meat eater is, is violent, but vegetarians are peaceful. No, to kill is to kill is to kill. It's just that the difference is the consciousness of the soul that is encased in the plant life form is vibrating on a lower level. It's not as developed, so it has to go through a few million more lifetimes before it receives what you would call a human body. So the evolution is not from man to ape or ape to man. The evolution is actually the soul as it becomes more and more conscious it takes on different forms of bodies this is how it's explained in the vedic literature different types of bodies as consciousness goes up the ladder till eventually you get to that rare and precious form of life which is the human form of life 
the plant form of life does have consciousness. It does feel pain. There's a reason why a tree could live through the whole winter. Don't think that it's totally immune to the stress of winter or the heat of the sun. No, it's not totally immune. It's just better adapted to survive these things. But that pain is still there. When you chop the tree, it feels some form of pain. So the whole idea in Bhagavad Gita chapter 3 it actually tells you the science of yagna or yajna y-a-j-n-a and the science of sacrifice is very interesting because the vedic yagna is designed to harmonize a vedic ritual sacrifice actually adds more to the environment than it takes from it and it purifies the environment i had mentioned before that when you burn cow dung it purifies the atmosphere for at least 25 mile radius and when you add ghee, which is clarified or purified butter, when you add ghee to cow dung and burn it, it releases oxygen. So we have cow dung is an amazing thing, and that's also used in some auspicious rituals. Uh, cow dung, pure cow dung, because you know cow dung is the only feces on the planet Earth that's anti microbial antibacterial it just ain't dirty it ain't got nothing nasty in it it's the only thing on the earth that's clean that comes out of the rare end of a living entity is cow dung that's why they call it gobar or cow treasure so all of these different ritualistic aspects that they do even the, the burning of the fire and then the byproducts that's left behind are reabsorbed back into the environment so a vedic yagna now vedic yagna is very important remember we're dealing with chapter three Sacrifice is important in order to renew your resources. We make sacrifices for the ancestors. We make sacrifices for the demigods. You're receiving all of the sunlight. Nobody wakes up and salutes the sun. Did you know that the sun cures diseases? Like, for real. Like, there's salutations to the solar deity that can cure diseases. You know? There's, there's a science to the moon and respecting the waters and respecting the earth and the fire. We got to respect the elements. We got to respect everything that comes from the creator. And we got to respect the controllers who have been appointed. Just like if you receive some status or some position, we respect. Violence comes in when we have to take life to sustain life. And we do yagnas to balance out any negative karma. Okay, that's what yagna or sacrifice, ritualistic sacrifice is all about. It's just balancing out the fact that you take something, you got to give something. Preferably not your life. And that's where sacrifice comes in. So violence, yeah. A vegetarian is just as violent as a meat eater. It's just that you're taking less, on, less karma on because you're taking from a lower life form. And you could actually reverse it where there's no karma just by simply offering the vegetarian foodstuffs to the Lord prior to consuming them, prior to even making them, actually. So, yes, violence is hand-in-hand hand with sex, whether it comes in the form of rape or to defend your mate from another paramour, you know, the advances of another person, then violence might play a part. Once again, to sleep, to eat, to do all of the basic animal things, we need violence in this material world. And that brings us, once again, back to the Bhagavad Gita, because... Basically, that was a treatise on violence, the most violent single incident that ever happened in the history of modern times, the last X amount of thousands of years, was the Battle of Mahabharat. And once again, the Kemetic version, they'll tell you that there was a world war, 3100 BCE, and Kemet was a part of it as well. So, this... War was a spiritual war, and Krishna had to convince Arjun of the necessity for violence in order to maintain the stability of society. And that same place, out of the Kurukshetra, the field, previously some serious austerities were performed at that spot where even the demigods came to the planet Earth to see what this king was doing in a field with a plow. What are you doing to the land? He was doing something, a form of enchantment. Look it up. It's all there in Itihasa. It's there in the Mahabharata. It'll tell you what this king did prior to the battle of Kurukshetra, which made it a holy place for all time. That anybody who dies over there, or anybody who performs a certain ritual sacrifices over there, they automatically receive the highest level. So... Violence, yes, yes, necessary. Also, violence is also necessary when diplomacy fails. Diplomacy is, is something that also holds weight because that's a form of communication. And when you can no longer communicate with the mouth, 
another interesting thing that I, I learned. When people are in love, and when people love each other, care for each other, they speak to each other in soft, low, warm tones. But when people are angry at each other, they yell and scream and, and argue, even if they're sitting this close, face to face. Why? Because with the people who are close, their hearts are close together. But when people are angry at each other, their hearts have a far distance between each other. So they have to yell to communicate with the person that they're angry at. So yeah, violence is there. It's necessary. Believe it or not, even righteous violence, righteous anger, all of these things are necessary to maintain stability. Nobody likes the cops. But believe you me, as bad as things are, no, ain't nobody making no excuses for the police. Don't even get it twisted. I'm just saying, as bad as things are, even with the police abuse and the police brutality, society would have been that much worse if they wasn't around. Because at that point... It's the law of the jungle, where might is right. Once again, the jungle, these basic human senses, these five senses, this material body, these five elements, everything about it is leading. It's a path, a network of paths that lead to death. The law of the jungle, the law where might is right. That's violence. You know what I'm saying? And it's rough if you're living in a pack of wolves and you're not the alpha male, there's a strong possibility you ain't having no sex life. You're going to either have to take over that pack or go live with another pack and maybe it has a weaker male that you could take over. It's, it's deep. It's deep. Animal life ain't easy. There's a lot of violence there. But humanity is the only ones that got to specifically deal with this thing called karma. And I don't know, like I said, I don't want to touch on karma because it's so such a vast subject, but... For, the, for intent, let's, let's deal with the Bhagavad Gita again. It deals with five subjects. The super soul or the supreme personality of Godhead. The supreme Brahman. The Paramatma. Whatever you call the, the highest deity. It deals with that primarily. Then it deals with you. The individual eternal living soul. It also deals with nature. And it deals with karma. So we're dealing with karma, the soul. The super soul, nature. These four things, out of all of those things, only one of those things is not permanent. <laughs> and that thing is karma. So we understand that karma begins at some point in our sojourn in the material universe. It is not going on because now everything in the material world is cause and reaction, right? In the spiritual world, there's only the cause. But here's the catch. It's not a singularity in, in that there's no motion or nothing. There's a hom homogenous state. No. Actually, there's unlimited variegatedness or va variety in the spiritual world. And everything is there in its original form. Substantial form. Whereas in the material world, we have prototypes and then we have things that are made as copies of that or clones of that in the spiritual world everything is the original thing all right everything substantial everything move every time you move that's the original movement that's the first movement it's hard to really grasp these concepts like oh oh one more thing that Bhagavad Gita deals with it's time so all of these things time karma soul super soul and nature all of these things are eternal except karma so karma if it has a beginning and has an end which means it can be manipulated or it can be destroyed. So karma is not as uh, stringent as we think it is. It can be affected. And once again, most people, if they want to directly affect their karma, they'll either do a ritual about 13 days after the new moon and 13 days after the full moon called Pradosham. Those are the days where Lord Shiva's energy is predominant and he destroys the sins of devotees. And every day there's also a Pradosham hour. I believe it's one and a half hours before sunset and then again at a half an hour before sunset. It's Pradosham hour where if you do certain spiritual practices, Lord Shiva will actually burn up your karma for you. But to all, all purposes, panacea for burning karma is none other than the Hare Krishna mantra, which goes, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. That is 32 syllables, 
right there. So you do them 32 syllables, and you'll be all right. All right? Once again, if you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter, Sun Man Part 2, Sun Man P A T U. That's my Twitter handle, at Sun Man Part 2. Hit me up, whatever, or leave your comments. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this touches on what Sugar Ray needs to hear. And I'm going to go ahead and start working on the forward. Just give me a little time, all right, brother? All right, peace and blessings. Once again, Bhagavad Gita, as it is, as it is dot com for more information about the transcendental subjects. Peace.